a new episode of the Evolving Media Podcast. I'll admit it feels a bit strange to be doing a podcast in times like this. Surreal, to say the least. So let me preface this episode by wishing everyone listening all the best of luck in the upcoming weeks and months. We're all in this together. And that's the basis of what we're going to talk about today. See, I believe it's important to look at every possible positive angle when looking at the state of the world today. And one thing that struck me immediately, as uh, you know, a couple of months ago it became obvious that this pandemic could not possibly be contained in China, but would spread around the world in one way or another. Uh, one thing that struck me was that we'd all be living a collective journey together in the scope of this, perhaps the largest collective journey ever imagined. Listeners of this podcast and readers of my blog as well will have come across the term collective journey before. So it's the notion that storytelling and the audience's role in connection uh, to those stories have changed dramatically over the past decade or so, or so with uh, new habits, but also new technologies enabling us. No longer are we content with uh, merely spectating as the hero goes through his or her journey. We want to participate, to engage and we want our engagement to mean something. There are links to blogs exploring this notion of a collective journey in the description of this episode, so feel free to explore further. Now, one of the foremost proponents of this collective journey is Jeff Gomez of Starlight Runner Entertainment, and I'm beyond excited that we were able to find time to have a talk about the state of the world what the wrongs there are with regards to the stories we live and how those wrongs can be righted. If you want to discuss what we're talking here, feel free to hit me up on any social media or comment where you listen to this episode. Let's work together to ultimately make our story a good one. Welcome to the podcast. Jeff, so happy to have you on this podcast. Um, uh, hi, Simon. It's uh, it's tremendous to be here. Um, uh, I would uh, uh, really uh, only take this time for um, important things. And um, uh, I think that this podcast is important. I followed uh, the podcast every episode. Uh, such um, intelligent, well-reasoned discussion. I'm so glad to be a part of it. I'm so happy um, that you. I'm so happy that you took the time to talk to me today. We, there's some things that that we've been talking about earlier on that I think I think we both can agree that are very very have become actualized over the past, <laughs> past weeks and months in uh, enormous and incredible ways. Um, uh, yeah, we are. Um, I, I am in Manhattan, uh, New York City, Chelsea. Uh, not far from Times Square, um, at the uh, epicenter of the uh, viral outbreak in the United States. Yeah, uh, there are thousands and thousands of people who are ill. Um, uh, uh, fortunately, the ratio of of illness to to deaths is rather small right now, but that's because our hospitals have been uh, uh, doing their very best, and because uh, there are. Uh, incredible, uh, incredibly experienced emergency service people. So just a few blocks away from me is the Jacob Javits Center, and there are a, a couple of thousand beds uh, set up there mm. to receive people who have the virus. Um, this is a global pandemic. Um, uh, we are experiencing something that uh, perhaps for the first time since uh, the Second World War, and, and even then, uh, not every single nation uh, experienced that conflict. Well, every single nation is uh, grappling with uh, coronavirus uh, uh, today. Uh, so we are experiencing something that, um, that every person on the planet uh, must in some way acknowledge and grapple with. Um, for, for me, it's it's tough because um, uh, I have family members who are uh, uh, compromised as far as their rep respiratory system is concerned, uh, which means uh, I have to leave my home and take care of them. 
and that means um, uh, walking the streets, um, uh, which are largely empty. But when they're not empty, um, there are some people, the dis- disenfranchised, who are, are very unhappy. Mm. Uh, so there are uh, there are crimes. There are there's fighting in the streets. Um, there is a, a, a sense of unease. And uh, and although uh, for the vast majority, there is, a, a, you know, a feeling of congeniality between people, there is also danger. And um, and, uh, you know, um, it's something that I have to navigate um, even as I try to hold my business together at Starlight Runner Entertainment uh, and my uh, uh, my family who are uh, concerned and um, uh, uh, growing uh, more worried as we uh, have progressed. Absolutely. It's a it's it's as you were saying, it's something that connects everyone on Earth for the first time in I don't know when. And it's that there's no one particular enemy or or combatant that except for this one little tiny virus that is uh, just uh, basically the, the thing that we all have to somehow cope with and and cope with how we how we approach our current reality tell me how do you how do you juggle staying at home with still you know running businesses being creative doing what's your approach how do you have you found any methods any ways that that you can share uh you know um uh, uh, uh simon uh when we've talked uh, there's a, a a history uh for me of of things like anxiety uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, things like that. Uh, so my gosh, this would be the most cosmic <laughs> thing to, to respond to, uh, uh, if I am burdened with all of that. Um, uh, but, um, the, uh, uh, the effort that is being made is to, uh, remain calm, uh, to breathe, to, um, uh, and to express, uh, po- positivity, um, by removing, um, uh, negativity and, um, and by having faith that we as, uh, human beings have pulled together, uh, and gotten through these sorts of crises that we have access, uh, to incredible technology that allows us to uh, remain in communication with each other, but also to do, uh, for some of us to, to do our work. Um, uh, so, uh, Starlight Runner is, is functioning, uh, remotely. Uh, right now, everyone's home, and um, and a lot of the work that we do is writing or or graphic design. So uh, those are the sorts of things that can be done on these uh, um, modern laptops that that have this uh, power enough to um, uh, to get the job done. So um, uh, there's that. Uh, I have a teenage uh, daughter who was a, a very very social person, <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. and. Uh, who wants to go out and be with her friends and and uh, uh, finish school? She's a senior in high school, and and all of that has stopped uh, uh, completely, and that's uh, depressing and anxiety provoking, and um, and also um, you know frustrating. Um, to to go out uh, in my family means to jeopardize other family members. You know, it's it's not uh, something that can be uh, done casually. Even though, um, you know, in our hearts, we know individually we could probably take the virus, um, uh, but other members of our family can't. Um, so we, we just have to choose not to to take that risk. Um, so, you know, it's um, uh, we're, we're getting by uh, and uh, and we're thinking of, of clever things uh, to do to help our staff make money and and keep ourselves going. The other thing we're doing is is expanding uh, rapidly our uh, coaching and counseling capability. So um, uh, we've we've lowered all of our rates. Uh, we're seeing many people um, uh, for uh, y- you know a, a reasonable uh, a fee, and and uh, and I've gotten to talk to to people that I wouldn't normally uh, get a chance to, 
um, uh, from all over the world. Um, even in Italy, which is besieged uh, by coronavirus, I've, I've gotten to speak with uh, some uh, uh, young people who uh, want to uh, get into the entertainment industry and have dreams and hopes and, and see themselves in a future beyond uh, the crisis. Yes, I think that's what one thing that keeps people's hope up is to see to imagine what the world will be will be like after the pandemic has abated. And personally, I think we're going to see uh, some quite. I mean, if you look at it from a pessimistic viewpoint, humanity will be will remember it for a week or two and then go on to be humanity. But I do believe in my in my heart of hearts that. That, that I think we'll learn something from this. I think it's something that's so global. I think it's something that affects everyone so deeply in so many ways that I think we might see change that is for the better in the long run, that is. I agree, um, uh, Simon. Um, and um, and maybe this brings us to the heart of, of uh, our discussion, at least uh, from, uh, uh, from my standpoint. Mm. Um, we have um, it, when um, when thinking about the uh, new storytelling models um, and the, um, uh, the the kinds of stories uh, that are on the rise that that um, uh, and that need to be told and ought to be told. Um, these are very different from the standard um, uh, individual hero's journey uh, stories that we've seen. Uh, for the past uh, uh, a couple of centuries, the the concern that uh, that I think all of us need to turn to in our our storytelling is that uh, we're faced with systems that are uh, uh, deeply fragile, and um, uh, you'd never know it living day to day. You get up, you you go, you commute to work, you get the job done, you go home, you watch Netflix. <laughs> Um, it, it, it seems uh, okay. It seems like it's it's working, uh, but because of the um, uh, hyper uh, complication of the way uh, we've expanded as as a human race, there are um, um, aspects of how we've set up this system and and caused that system to interrelate to the planet's system. Uh, that is a uh, fragile yes. and in danger of of destruction. So, when thinking about um, the enemy or or the the source of conflict in uh, a collective journey story, um, we are now thinking a little bit less immediately about some villain, you know, some Darth Vader, um, some Hans Gruber, uh, to uh, uh, to be our villain. And more um, the flaws in the system. Those flaws can be represented by individuals at, who are uh, fully realized characters. But let's think of the flaws. And we've identified um, uh, three uh, sets of of flaws in the system um, uh, uh, that um, that we can talk about a little bit. The first is our greed, our weapons, our thirst for power. Yes. Have made us capable, have made us capable of destroying ourselves by force. Right. Yes. Absolutely. Um, uh, the, the second is uh, that our technology and irresponsible use of communication have made us capable of uh, destroying our sense making capability, our ability to understand and when you have that, when you've destroyed that, Simon, you are uh, allowing us to be flooded with bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Yeah, um, not just – it's not just lies. Lies have been historically they, – they've always been there, right? Politicians lie. Um, but, um, but, but we've always had a kind of collective uh, understanding of reality. In, in the past few years worldwide, lies have given way to, to bullshit, which is actually kind of malignant lying, uh, deception. Uh, uh, the bending of of reality uh, to accommodate uh, uh, someone's uh, personal uh, biases, 
and when you have rivers of bullshit, you are dislodging our capability to uh, understand what's going on, to, to, um, uh, to be able to communicate effectively, to reconcile uh, differences. Um, when, when, when that happens for a long enough period of time, uh, you can unravel the fabric of society. You can, uh, you can cause uh, empires to fall. We, we can destroy our civilization when we become unmoored uh, from a collective a reality. Mm. OK, yeah, the, the reason why what's happening right now is so stark and so remarkable is that something is happening that forces us <laughs> to acknowledge uh, its reality. And even now, not everybody <laughs> is is acknowledging it, um, uh, but more and more, I believe, are. OK, so uh, we we are capable of destroying ourselves by force. We are capable of destroying our ability to understand. And the third uh, and perhaps most relevant um, uh, fragility is that our pollutants and our disregard for the fragility of nature mm -hmm. have made us capable of destroying our environment. Mm -hmm. That disregard, and I know there are some mixed uh, understandings for where this virus came from, but it is an animal virus. Mm. Um, it is uh, um, uh, something that human beings have no immediate uh, immunity to, the coronavirus. That's why it's flooring so many people. That's why it's uh, uh, so virulently moving across the world. Human beings have no ability to resist it. Why? Because um, it was born out of uh, a, a situation where human beings were disregarding the danger. Um, and, and that is the danger of, of um, mixing uh, the, the slaughtered bodies of animals uh, together. Mm. Uh, the, the, the types of markets uh, that um, uh, the avian flu and the coronavirus uh, uh, came from our markets uh, where animals are uh, freely and openly slaughtered in immediately adjacent uh, to one another um, in crowded, unclean kinds of environments. This is no slight on any particular culture or location or something like that. It is a slight against our regard for how these uh, microbes uh, move around in, in the world. Yeah. And, and so... Uh, that disregard unleashed uh, a, a global pandemic. We have greed, we have bullshit, and we, we have the disregard for nature and, and the, the dangers inherit, inherited in that by, by being so disregarding of it. Uh, those three combined, I, I get the feeling that these are things that have become so ingrained in society that most people feel felt helpless to do anything about them. The flood of bullshit, the, the constant thought that growth has to mean more and more and more and not perhaps something else, uh, speaking economically and, and regarding political power, etc. And how we approach environment, which perhaps is the one of the three that has seen the most rise in awareness over the past years but still change yes. hasn't been made. Correct, correct. And, and if there is um, uh, something positive, something hopeful uh, to come out of, of this uh, narrative, and, um, and I, I do identify this as, as the most quintessential of collective journey narratives, <laughs> it, it, it would be um, uh, that, um, that we are grappling uh, with a a flawed system that is uh, so dangerous um, and so immediate that we are forced to be given pause, uh, that we are forced to re-examine ourselves um, and, and how this is working. In the, in the early part of the collective journey model, oh, maybe, maybe close to halfway through, uh, there is the step called anyone can die. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, um, uh, and, and really 
I think of all of the steps of the collective journey narrative in the case of the coronavirus, um, uh, this, this new modality of storytelling, anyone can die is the one uh, that identified, uh, uh, in this case, Tom Hanks or the Prince of England <laughs> or Idris Elba or, or um, uh, Congress uh, people and senators who have contracted uh, coronavirus. Um, uh, now, this touches anyone. Uh, now, the rich are not immune. Uh, the elite are not immune. Um, that means that we have uh, uh, something that, um, that actually can uh, impact the decision-making of, of those very few uh, in power, the, uh, the, the, the 1%, so to speak. Mm. That's absolutely, it doesn't care about race or sex or wealth or power or fame or anything. It's, uh, this is the one journey that everyone is on together. Every single one of us in the world right now. So it's, it's, if you look at it that way, it's a fairly powerful thing. And I'm seeing, I'm seeing so many stories of, uh, when we were talking about the hero's journey previously, we're seeing yeah. right now we have so many stories of of new heroes, like everyday people. If it's uh, if it's doctors, if it's uh, people helping out in one way or another, volunteers. If it's there's a lot of shitty stuff as well, still obviously. But we're mm -hmm. seeing how how we can be part of the positive force in the world, quite hands on. I'm hoping there will be a a upsurge in like, positive individualism within a collective, that we, we start to feel we have an agency, that we're not insignificant as single individuals in the part of the collective. So do you think that might be a possible outcome of this, that we see that we're not, we don't have to put up with the bullshit, we don't have to put up with the greed, we don't have to put up with the environment being being messed with. We we can have a say, even though we are individuals. Here's, here's um, uh, an interesting um, uh, empirical uh, observation. Um, yeah. uh, as you know, Starlight Runner tracks, um, uh, you know, popular response to various kinds of media. Fox News, uh, which is um, uh, essentially uh, amplifies the messages of uh, uh, President Donald Trump. Yes. Um, the, the core audience uh, for Fox News is rather old. The vast majority of, of viewers of, of Fox News in the United States um, are, are over 50 years old, uh, many in their 60s. Um, so when uh, they uh, hear and, and see uh, uh, signals uh, by the uh, elected leader, uh, that everything's going to be all right, that um, that anybody can be tested, that um, uh, this is all going to go away in a couple of weeks. Even these people who have been fiercely loyal, MAGA people, um, mm. uh, their sense making is, is stressed uh, because they can see with their own eyes what's happening outside their windows and they know uh, that they are the most vulnerable and the most susceptible uh, to coronavirus. Mm -hmm. They can die yeah. um, uh, from it. Um, so this is creating uh, a cognitive dissonance in, in them uh, that is uh, uh, causing them to, to te start testing their sense-making. Some of the comments uh, that I'm starting to see uh, out of these uh, audience members uh, um, would include, do they think we're stupid? <laughs> yeah. or, or I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> you know, like it's, it's, uh, it's just the beginning of, of, uh, of this kind of, um, of, of movement that, um, that pushes us past um, uh, the uh, hyper individualism uh, uh, toward a, a kind of plurality, and in that plurality comes the potential for true change. You know, um, uh, comes the potential to to start having uh, discussions that are 
not just more uh, candid because we've been uh, uh, giving each other our opinions a whole lot <laughs> in recent years, <laughs> but in support of collective sense making. Uh, uh, so that um, so that we can establish a common reality that we can react uh, uh, toward and attempt to resolve. Does that make sense, Simon? It, it does make sense. And I think that, uh, as you were talking about, one of the most important things is to question what you have, question your beliefs regularly and uh, question what you're being told. It, because that's one thing that takes that takes energy. And it's so much easier to stay in your echo chamber and have your beliefs and your values and and your thinking confirmed by everything that's uh, that you're being told. But chances are that that doesn't reflect reality, not by a not by a long shot. And that goes for any echo chamber you could talk of. So, I, I mean, if this could be an agent for people starting to take more to take more responsibility for their own perception of reality and not let it be spoon fed to them and that's that's a powerful thing that will change a lot of things in the world i think so let me talk about uh, uh, simon ways to uh, actually activate that yes please. um uh, and um uh, i think that um uh, just to exemplify I've been a part of the uh, Aspen Institute, um, which uh, sometimes collects people who have uh, certain kinds of, of specialties um, to uh, to discuss issues uh, that are of concern to the uh, United States and to the greater world. Mm-hmm. Um, the um, uh, members of the institute uh, contacted me, and we that that information is sometimes shared with the United States government. Um, uh, and and can help uh, you know deal with issues such as uh, the uh, recruitment of people to ISIS um, uh, or the um, the issue of um, uh, the hyper uh, polarized um, uh, citizenry of the United States uh, uh, left and right that that sort of thing. So um, uh, I, I was contacted and we had a uh, a discussion. Uh, about uh, what should be done in the face of of the virus, and of course, um, uh, we were given access to you know some data, and and uh, you know there are there are worst case scenarios, and and some of that stuff can be pretty grave. Uh, I'm hoping that um, that the uh, most of the country has has reacted to counter uh, those worst case scenarios situations. Uh, but we're not out of the woods yet. Uh, anyway, um, uh, I, I was very encouraged uh, because there are members of uh, the administration who've reached out to me through this network uh, for the first time since uh, Trump came into the White House. And um, um, and and they said, well, how, how do you um, bring – uh, this new model of storytelling to to assist, and um, uh, we talked about how uh, spontaneous, self-organized response can be promoted through narrative across multiple media platforms, mm-hmm. uh, uh, transmedia population activation, uh, in support of things like uh, making sure that our supply chains are intact. Because Simon, in in, uh, in the past uh, twenty years, uh, our supply chains have been super stretched, right? As as we've globalized, yeah. Um, uh, the sources of our food and um, our our you know uh, uh, anything, our items, <laughs> anything made of plastic, <laughs> uh, they're from across the world. They're from fantastic distances, and um, and of course they travel quickly when the system is operational. Uh, but, um, but right now, with what's going on, there is a, a 24 to 48 hour delay. Um, and that has created fantastic shortages, and uh, particularly in the medical uh, uh, field, uh, uh, huge uh, problems. Not only uh, was I supportive of promoting uh, self-organized communities to make sure that that supply chain remains intact. 
Um, but um, uh, we have to start talking about shortening the supply chains yes. uh, to to bring um, a, a more localized uh, uh, ability to survive over uh, longer periods of time. It's not as simple as saying, oh, we need to bring industry back to the United States, <laughs> you know, um, uh, that may be a part of it. But what we really need to think about is, is how can we um, establish more agrarian and agricultural um, uh, localities, uh, you know, um, how, how we can support ourselves locally uh, in the case of, of such situations so that we don't have to worry or even panic uh, about uh, these uh, great distances. Um, the other thing that I, I talked about was how to get messaging out there that can help people understand what to do uh, uh, in support of hospitals and, and in the creation of, of places that can um, uh, help people who are sick mm. um, and, um, uh, and, and allow for that spillover to move smoothly to, to other locations. Um, and, um, uh, you know, my, uh, my opinion, I don't know that it accounts for a hill of beans, uh, but uh, that's been one of the most gratifying things to see uh, across the world, how, how um, uh, there is this um, movement, uh, how, how people are sewing masks uh, uh, by the dozens and hundreds and, and, and giving them to those in need. Yeah. Uh, collecting um, sanitized uh, uh, fluids and, and and things like that to um, uh, to help one another. It's it's really really wonderful to to see this sort of thing. So we're watching a, a kind of collective movement which is gaining uh, momentum and um, and allowing for uh, for uh, the the worst of of what can happen to be blunted uh, a, a little bit in uh, in areas around the world um, and and that could lead to change making not only with regard to whether we beat the virus or not um, but uh, uh, toward whether we can choose to hold on to this ability to um, uh, perceive reality collectively, um, uh, to be able to discern the facts together and, and maintain our sense making. So the last thing uh, I'm going to mention before I, I let you talk, Simon, <laughs> it is that, um, uh, I'm working in support of, of Tristan Harris and a group of people who've come out of these, uh, discussions to ask social media to immediately, uh, uh begin uh, building sense-making tools. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so this isn't simply asking social media to publish uh, the truth <laughs> or or only the facts. Um, this is asking social media to take responsibility for teaching us how to read social media. Um, this is asking Facebook and Twitter and uh, TikTok <laughs> oh, yeah. um, to to make us understand um, uh, how to uh, uh, gather information and uh, uh, peel away interpretations so that we can understand the underlying facts, what actually happened, what existed in three-dimensional space, so that we are capable of drawing our own conclusions and not being fed our conclusions because you know Simon uh, the leaders of this world the elite um, uh, they're going to want to return as quickly as possible uh, to the chaotic uh, uh, unmooring of, of the understanding of, of the facts they are going to want to scramble our sense making capability as soon as possible um, uh, because it works to their advantage you know and I'm not being biased toward, toward or against any single leader it's just what we are encountering today. Um, uh, so we uh, have to be our own heroes. Um, no one is coming to save us. We have to save ourselves, and we're going to need to do so uh, by developing our sense-making skills. We can't do it alone. Uh, we need for 
um, uh, the leaders uh, of, of Google and Facebook and, and so forth to help us and give us tool sets uh, to allow for um, uh, us to discern facts and to make sense of, of a common uh, reality. Mm. I, I think that was one of the most uh, powerful uh, parts of the theories behind the collective journey, the, the notion that in the old stories, the hero came in and saved the day. But in, in our collective journey, no, no one is saving anyone. It's, it's, it's ourselves saving ourselves together uh, and individually. It's, it's no one riding in on a horse or a motorbike or whatever sort of vehicle of transportation people are riding into the villages and cities with right now. But, but it's, it's on us to do it. And uh, it rings very true what you're saying that, that I, I also believe that there are major forces in the world that as soon as we are out of the woods, would very much like to see the world return to the, the, the status or the, the, the way it was before the pandemic hit. I, I don't think that's in the interest uh, of the vast majority of people on Earth. And I do believe that we um, I, I hope and I believe that we're going to see movement in that direction towards a more self, self-sustainable, not in the nourishing or economical sense, perhaps that as well, but a more self-sustainable when it comes to information, when it comes to decision making, when it comes to agency, when it comes to um, just being in control of your own destiny, uh, both individually and, and as, as a collective. I think no one wants to be just in the hands of something else and feel that they they can't affect what they what their lives are going to look like, and and this pandemic has set that into stark contrast to 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 what we've how we've been living up until now for the past decades. The enemy, Simon, of bullshit <laughs> is is reconciliation. And by reconciliation, I don't mean uh, kissing and making up. <laughs> I, I mean the capability for us to reconcile the facts um, and, and to uh, to be able to uh, juxtapose our ideas and perspectives to yield uh, a course of action that is of benefit um, uh, to uh, uh, to both of us, to all of us, right? Uh, yeah. We don't have to be rivalrous uh, about everything. Uh, r- rivalry uh, creates a, a very tiny elite um, who then uh, uh, are capable of generating the reality that we perceive um, uh, through the media, through their power, um, uh, uh, and, and through their uh, uh, destructive capabilities. Uh, why not um, uh, reconsider? And uh, an attempt to to reconcile so that we can discern the facts and and make the uh, at least base our decision making on the facts. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so um, uh, this is um, uh, this is what can lead to um, uh, making the world a better place uh, to to positive change making that benefits um, uh, more people. Um, uh, I, this is not an anti-wealth screed. <laughs> um, I, I have a few bucks myself, and and uh, <laughs> I, I like money, um, but um, uh, we we do need to be able to um, uh, not uh, destroy ourselves, and um, uh, and so um, a reconciliation um, and uh, and the ability to discern the facts are. Uh, you know, a primary. I think it's a fascinating time we are living in. It's a terrible time. And I I would, in a sense, I would, of course, rather that this pandemic hasn't occurred or hadn't occurred at all, obviously. But we're in it and I'm seeing some encouraging signs that there might be some good come out of it as well by the end of things. How do you feel? Are you, do, do you feel positive? Uh, that, do, do you feel... Do you feel that there is a possibility that we might might look back on this time as a changing point for for how people perceive their own realities or agencies? Uh, uh, Simon, I have to. 
Um, I, I have to, and I based uh, my optimism on the fact uh, that the human race has come uh, such a long way. Um, uh, there is less uh, suffering now uh, than there has been, you know, in, in the whole of human history. Uh, there is less uh, 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 war and, and violence um, uh, than there has been. Um, uh, our technology has uh, um, made us, uh, you know, live longer, um, um, you know, uh, deal with uh, a disease. Our, our children are smarter and, and more capable than, than they have been. Um, we're a super organism, a complex system that is being made ill and fragile by inorganic complication, right? Mm -hmm. Rivalry defector mentality, self-hatred, self-deception. Uh, uh, these are increasing uh, the complications as we mature as, as a human race. So we have to discern the facts from the bullshit. But also, um, uh, my, my hope, uh, Simon, as, as you uh, put it, is, um, is that perhaps uh, a, a new epoch um, that is centered on, on the fact that we have to acknowledge our interdependence, uh, that, that we have to engage in long-term thinking and, uh, and, and, and find ourselves in profound collaboration, uh, wrapped in a blanket of empathy and compassion, that that is uh, uh, something that we can uh, move forward with uh, together. It feels like humanity has sh should should move on, should evolve. It's it's high time to move out of the, I don't know if we've been in an adolescent phase or something, but where uh, the me, 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 me uh, has been accentuated by social media's rise and, uh, uh, and how people perceive things like fame, power, wealth, etc. Uh, it feels like we should be moving on from that. It feels like we should mature, and perhaps this might be the time to do it. I uh, absolutely hope you're you're correct. Uh, let's you and I, Simon, and our audience, uh, let's work toward this. Yes. Um, uh, it's not just a, a, a platitude. Uh, let's go to work, and um, and let's demand that the uh, the the tools that we use are improved. And that um, uh, that uh, you know we walk away uh, with a, a a tremendous lesson learned, Jeff. With with that, I, I thank you very much for joining me for the for this uh, episode of the podcast. A, a joy to talk to you as always. Thank you very much. A great pleasure, Simon. Thank you. Oh.